Welcome back, my steel design friends. In the last video, we set up a derivation that showed us the Euler buckling load and kind of where it came from mat from a mathematical perspective. But then towards the end, we mentioned some assumptions that had to be made in his derivation. You know, and those assumptions were that the column is perfectly straight, the load is axial, it's pinned at both ends, and that there was no residual stress from fabrication. In reality, we also said that none of these are true. So we have to take into account some corrections to the Euler equation before we can actually put it to work for us and um, using the AISC methodology. And so that's the purpose of this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Of the assumptions that we had with Euler buckling, perhaps the most critical one is the fact that the ends are not necessarily pinned. And in many structures, it, that's not the case. We have one member being bolted to another, it's being braced by, you know, a column is being braced by a beam at a connection. We don't have a free rotation or a free pin at that location. So we've got to come up with a correction that allows us to model not only the pin pin case, but also these cases where there's some restraint that happens in the ends. Okay. So this is um, what we're going to be looking at kind of taking care of. This is the, the purposes of this is to define something known as the effective length factor. Okay. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. All right, so here's kind of our, our basics. Um, as we talked about last time, if we plot the stress or you know the, the the critical stress on this you know, for a for a given member we we stated that you no know, there were some problems with you know elastic but you know where the elastic buckling followed the Euler line very very well okay and here's our basic Euler stress equation okay versus you know what happens in the inelastic region where it started to deviate and kind of approaches a constant value right and we're getting into an inelastic behavior well, we can still kind of use a buckling approach by using what we call a tangential um, elastic, uh, elastic modulus. Okay, and so what that basically means is that if we look at a stress strain curve for steel, okay, the base for mechanics and materials, we knew that it was basically linear in the elastic region and followed a slope of e to one. Okay, what happens now is, is that as you get past that proportional limit and get up into the inelastic region, because remember, elastic stopped right there. So inelastic was everything happening beyond that, that we, got, we can come up here and take what would be a tangent line, a slope of this that is now ET um, to the one, because basically that's what this is down here, is this is a tangent line to a linear function. It's just the function itself. Okay, and so it's this guy, and this is a bit of a challenge to get, but it is a method to be able to kind of apply this weakening or softening effect, because as this point gets more and more over here, you know, that tangent line goes from here and it starts to kind of flatten out a little bit, you know, as we get further out. And eventually it's, you know, not quite horizontal, but it's pretty flat, meaning it's a very soft at that point. And it's kind of on the verge of potentially having problems. Okay. So the basic idea that we look at is, you know, so, so that's how we can kind of handle this inelastic versus elastic approach. Okay. But for cases where both ends are not true pins, okay, this is the case that we have to start to kind of look at. So what they do is they come in and they say, well, instead of being pi squared E over L over R squared, let's put a modification factor on L. Okay, and this is called the effective length factor and it's always given as a, a, as a variable K. Okay, so now let's go back and look at those, the, the, so, some typical in support conditions on here. Okay, and we'll look at some of the, the most, uh, kind of the most extreme. So the first one that we'll look at is our original pin pin case, right? Well, if it's pin pin, this is the Euler buckling load. I know that I can say the K times L, that it's basically L is the effective length, right? That, so meaning that K is 1.0 and I get the exact behavior that we had before when I come up and I play with this buckling equation here. We're gonna plug a K of 1.0 and it's exactly the Euler equation again. All right, now, if I have a fixed, a pure fixed condition on here, Okay, well then what happens is, is that there are inflection points tucked in here a little bit such that the buckling occurs basically over a length of, of a half an L. Okay, that K times L is equal to one over two L. So in this case, K is taken as 
0 0.5. So on one end, we have free to rotate k is 1. On the other end, we have fully fixed k is a half. Everything else is in between. Okay, now, one of the things that we've got to be careful of, and this is another assumption that was made, is that we did not allow this point to drift either way, you know, meaning that there, you know, it's not like a flagpole condition where I put a load. In this one, you can actually get a deflected shape in which this guy moves over and we get some sort of what we call side sway to it. And we'll have to handle that one a little bit differently. So we're going to focus first on our columns that are restrained from side sway, no side sway. So the bottoms and top are restrained. That's the note that we have here. All right. Now, some of the other combinations that can occur, what happens if I have one fixed and one pinned? Well, then that equation is said to be k times l is approximately 0.7 l. So for if I have those in conditions, I'm going to apply a k value of 0.7. Okay, and then we get into kind of the realistic structure in which we allow some rotation, but it's not truly pinned and it's not truly fixed, that then these points become variable on here in which k is less, k times l is less than l. Okay, and we're looking at these inflection points that are happening. And so we'll have to come up with a methodology to allow us to find a k that's more accurately represented than these simple cases that we have, the simply, uh, simply supported and the fixed fixed. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. And this is basically every structure out there if we start to kind of look at it. It's what we call the side sway inhibited case. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming video. So those are our K values. Now, if we go in and we look at the AISC manual on this, okay, back in the specification on page 16.1-570, you'll find this table. This is in the commentary, okay? And this actually has, let me get myself zoomed out a little bit so you can see a little bit better, see the rest of the page on this is a whole slew of cases that we just basically talked about. Okay, and so the line that we were talking about was this theoretical k value line. So if it's fixed fixed, we said k was a half, there it is. If it's fixed pinned, k was 0.7, there it is. If it's pin pinned, k 1.0, there it is. But they also include the side sway cases in here as well, such as if it's fixed but allowed to drift, you know, then k is equal to 1.0. Whereas if it's fixed at the bottom and free at the end and allowed to drift, now K is basically 2.0, okay? It's a huge value, okay? And then, of course, we have if it's pinned and allowed to drift, then we're going to take, um, or pin fixed with a allowed to drift on this, then it's also a 2.0 as well, okay? But again, this isn't all of the cases, but this has the major ones. But what AISC does is they actually say, well, I know that this isn't really true, Okay, and I know that this isn't really true, that reality, or, or sorry, the pin, that this isn't really true, but reality is somewhere in between this one and this one. Okay, and so what happens is it means that if this is an extreme 0 0.5, then the real behavior for a fixed fix will probably have a K value that isn't fully fixed, meaning that K will be a little bit larger. And so they recommend that you use a 0 0.65 as a recommended value. Okay, whereas for a pin case on here, this one, we're going to go ahead and keep it as, a, as, a, as an upper bound 1.0 as being the worst possible scenario. But we've got to kind of correct this because that greatly decreases the load that the, or, or greatly increases the load if it's fixed fixed. So we've got to kind of soften it up and not allow us to count for as much load as we would have otherwise. So these recommended values become kind of um, useful as we start to kind of look in those sections. This is a good one to put an index on because you'll be coming back to this, eventually memorize the values, but on the next page, We'll get into something called the alignment charts, okay? And this is how you find all of the K values for, a, for, for that, that last case. In fact, if you look at the picture that we showed here, that's the exact diagram that you're seeing here. But there's a chart here in which this thing is not allowed to sway. And then the chart on the next page, if you come over and look at it, okay, this guy is where we do allow it to sway. And I'll show you how to handle those in a, in a future video. But th that's the basis for our effective lengths, okay? They're very simple and they are a correction then that goes in to our critical Euler stress equation, pi squared E over K over L, KL over R squared, okay? And so that's how we're gonna correct this is by playing with these K factors and plugging those in. That will get us 
kind of an elastic behavior under these support conditions. So I hope that's made sense. This is a fairly short video. It's a pretty simple concept, but I wanted to at least split it out a little bit separately. So as always, if you've got any comments or questions, let us know um, in, the, in the section down below. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Happy engineering.